get up, get, get up, get up. Hey, welcome back, Mets fans. It has been a minute. It's been a while since we last spoke to you. Obviously, some holidays have happened. Have a happy new year. It's now 2023. This is the first episode of the Mets Up podcast in the year 2023, the official podcast of the New York Mets. A lot has gone on in Mets world since we last spoke to you guys. We've been seeing the tweets. We've been hearing you. First and foremost, just going to come out and say, we know there's a giant elephant in the room that everyone wants to speak about. And it's we, we know what it is. We want you to know that we acknowledge that this is a thing that is happening in Mets world. But obviously, we are the official podcast of the New York Mets. And while we don't know anything, we cannot talk about anything just because stuff is not official, stuff is not accurate, whatever it is. We have to remain professional as we do have an affiliation with the New York Mets. But just know that as soon as we do have information on whatever this elephant in the room could be, we will talk about it. But that's why it's been a little radio silent from us. Uh, it's just a little bit difficult to talk about things that we're not allowed to talk about because of the rules and how things work. But we do have a lot of other things that we can talk about. Adam Adovino's back. We interviewed Justin Verlander and Kodai Senga. If you guys didn't see that, we'll dive, vo- or dive into that a little bit more. James McCann got traded. We hired new coaches, guys in and out. There are still things to talk about here, and we wanted to just come back with the new year and give you guys a little bit of Mets content that you've been waiting for. So thank you guys so much for sticking around with us. Hope you stick around for the entire 23 season and further on. If you guys are not yet following us on all our social media, follow us at Mets Up on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you're looking for the YouTube video version of this, the New York Mets YouTube channel. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, drop us a rating, drop us a review. Really do appreciate it. But James, it's been a minute. I haven't I haven't seen you in so long. You've been home. You've been hanging out with the family. It's a new year. How are you feeling? You got a new haircut for those of you who are watching the video. When's the last time you got a haircut, honestly? I did. The last time I got a haircut was actually in September, right before we went to MLB Network that day. I got a haircut just the day before, just, you know, clean it up a little bit. So this is only, this is only my second haircut since the Messed Up Podcast became affiliated with the New York Mets. <laughs> Would you remember that? Remember that one viewer on YouTube who told me I had to clean it up a little bit with the Mets now? Called me the Wolfman. Well, he there you go. He wins. He, I hope he's still. I hope he's yeah, still. We'll taking be checking notes. the comment section to see if that guy is chiming in and letting you know that you now look professional and esteemed and and ready. It's it's a clean cut, James. I'll give you that. I mean, I got myself a haircut, but it never gets nearly as long as your hair gets. It's funny. I actually made this joke. I was in my office yesterday for the first time, also in weeks. It's almost longer than since we the last time we've done this podcast and i looked around like every single person got a haircut there's like just guys get haaircuts oh 100 i it's like you could yeah take a take a break look around a little bit and just get you know i went up. home and got my haircut immediately my mom's like you want a haircut i'm like yeah I'm, I'm home it's new year you gotta get a new cut you gotta look fresh and i think that's what's happening new look new year right to rock and roll so like we said it's been a while since we last spoke to you guys we did have the justin verlander and kodai senga interviews come out in between now and when the actual last full in-person episode has happened and there's a lot to talk about i mean first and foremost i think we should probably talk about those interviews just because you guys didn't really get to hear our opinions about what happened and how those days went i I mean it was pretty sick i I, that's kind of how i want to describe it is awesome it was and they happened only a few days apart so it kind of like made it feel a little bit more intense like because we were in that in that press conference room and in that players uh, locker room doing like where they set up our studio, like back to back, basically. It might have actually been. I think it was. Back to back I think days, it was back to back. Maybe days, one day yeah. in between. Yeah, this was this was December. December didn't feel like it existed anymore, but it was just cool that they were each their own like unique, unique kind of thing. So the first one was Sanga, which you guys hopefully go back and listen to, where he doesn't speak very much English whatsoever, and not that many people know anything about Kodai Sanga. He's he himself said in the interview he had never been to New York before he started thinking about coming to the Mets. Only around October or November. So it was a lot of kind of getting to know each other, a lot of like kind of feeling each other out, cracking some jokes, using, we have to use a lot of body language and verbal cues. So I'd suggest you guys go check out the YouTube video because that's how we kind of really got to talk to him because we did all the rest of it through a translator, but he was great. He's a competitor. He's a worker. He has an amazing sense of humor. He's really excited to be here. And he just seems, he just, just seems like such like, this is a term I've heard thrown out, but just like a yeah. baseball rat. Like he loves working. He loves learning. He loves improving. He loves adding and that. It was nice to be able to sit down with him and feel yeah, all that. Yeah, one of the things that him. we've spoke about on this podcast at length is not only does he have the stuff on the field, but we love that he wants to get better. He was a driveline guy. He's actively trying to throw harder and faster and have more movement. He's constantly working. 
It's an amazing thing to hear from a guy. And I have a funny story too with the Senga interview because I have a friend, shout out to my boy Wheels, whose mom is like a Japanese, like graduate student teacher. She speaks fluent Japanese from Japan. She was watching the Kodai Senga interview in Japan. And at one point he said like something in a very specific slang or like dialect that was Japanese that like, she's like, most Japanese people don't even necessarily know what that means. But basically he was saying like, I don't know how to say this. This is hard. And I answered it as if I knew. I was like, I know. I think I said like, I know, like, or something like that. She's like, does he know what he's saying? Like that, that's unbelievable. But it was just like the weird coincidence of somehow we could read his body language and the way that it was working. And you just, you know, when someone's feeling a certain way. And like you said, when we were interviewing him, a lot of gesturing, it felt like by us as well. No, he's demonstrative. He's fun. He just seems like he's going to be a really good fit in this clubhouse and in this organization. And of course, also on on the field, very excited about watching a pitch too. And then fast forward a day from there and we had the Justin Verlander interview, which is, it was like, it was, it was a unique situation for us because he's the most, I'd probably say like famous person we've ever been around, like in general, it been around in a way that we were actually able to conversate with them and like have interactions with them me at least Pro- probably. I think so. Yeah. And it was like touch and go because it was a very busy day. He had to do a lot of other press spots. We're like, we hope we get him. We hope we get him. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever happens, happens. And then he walked in and he's like, it's just such a huge built dude. He's a multiple Cy Young winner, World Series winner, larger than life. And he just like sits down. We just start talking. It's just, just, just talking baseball with Justin Verlander. And it kind of, it just went by and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe. Gave major props to the name of the podcast, which is a big tip of the cap to James over there for coming up with the creative name, messed up. He was like, oh, your guy, what's the name of your guy's podcast? And then we said it. And he's like, I like that name. That's a good name. You're like, I made it. Thank you very much, Justin Verlander. Like, didn't expect to get complimented from you today. I, The thing that really stuck out to me, and again, if you saw the interview, you wouldn't be able to tell this. This is like all a little bit behind the scenes stuff. But the fact that like we knew we were on a time crunch, we knew we had a, a, a flight to catch, and we didn't feel rushed. And I think that's like a really, it wouldn't have been wrong if we felt rushed because he was, he was on a time crunch and somehow it still felt like he very much like wanted to be there, wanted to talk with us, was happy to be there. And I think that's really important because I mean, it's only, it's only going to be more and more people <laughs> asking him questions. So the fact that he was just able to handle that and what was like a not real stressful situation, but was, because I mean, you don't want to miss your flight. I, th- I thought that was really cool. And he's such a huge human too. I didn't realize how big he was huge human and like you kind of forget that because it's been so long ago but when you're a pitcher that's drafted at the top of the draft like that you definitely have all of the measurables but it was it was just cool to like see a different side of someone who we've watched like literally our entire baseball lives like we were watching justin verlander pitch and win a cy young when we were in what like early in high school like 2011 we were like 14 15 16 years old and this guy was on top of the world like if you were the told Mark and James and they were fifteen that you're gonna you're gonna make Justin Verlander yeah. laugh when you when you're twenty six, be like, What? How? Am I like yelling at him from the stands or something? It's like well timed joke. But no, it was it's cool to have these human interactions with someone who is gonna be in this team, gonna be a big part of this team, big part of this rotation. Yeah, I mean forward. we've now spoke to two future Hall of Famers at least in Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander, which is pretty cool. Even cooler that they play for the Mets. That's the I think that's like even the the sneaky cool part. We got to talk to them. But we also get to root for them now because, I mean, for a while, for most of their career, we've known them to play against the Mets or be on other teams. Now they're on the New York Mets, which is really cool. Great one-two punch alongside Senga, brought in Quintana. We have a lot of, you know, Carrasco, Peterson, McGill. The Mets have a plethora of starting pitching depth, which is something that me and you have talked about a lot on this podcast. Never, never a problem to have, like, 15 starting pitchers. No one ever goes, that team's got too much pitching. Eliezer Hernandez, Joey Lucchese also will come back at some point. Guys are going to be swingmen, guys who could fill innings. They, this, this front office answered, at, we're going to talk about the pitching side of the ball, every every single thing we've asked them to do so far this offseason. They added bullpen depth in diverse ways. They added as many starting pitchers as they possibly could find. Veteran guys with young guys to supplement them in. It's it, it looks like, on paper, it looks like a plan that was really well executed, and it's really cool to see that. From Mets yeah, and I think office. one thing that got a little bit lost in the shuffle too with what's been going on in Mets world is that Adam Adovino is also back, which is really big because how good was he last year? How nasty was that slider? His fat, like everything was clicking so well. And we know relievers are very volatile. It's hard to project necessarily what a guy's going to do. But for a guy who has performed well in New York, both with the Yankees and the Mets, I mean, I'm I'm really glad he's back part of this bullpen. Where at one point we were like, okay, Robertson's going to fill in the Adovino role. We we got Adovino back. Like again, just a ton of good arms along with Drew Smith. Yeah, it's like it's it's so nice. 
when we talk about relievers a lot in this podcast, we talk about just being able to strike guys out and not walking guys. And something else I've also been like looking at more recently, learning more about recently, reading people talk about more recently is about how vital ground ball rate is, especially for relievers, because keep the ball on the ground, it's impossible to leave the yard. Like you want, you would like a ground ball every single at bat if you could. Maybe next year with the shift, that'll change, remains to be seen. But only three relief pitchers in 2022 had at least a 30% strikeout rate, a 50% ground ball rate, and a less than 10% walk rate. Three relievers in the entire game. Andres Munoz, who we've talked about ad nauseum, one of the best relievers in baseball. That was Joan Duran, yes. who I've recently told Mark is a freak of nature. It's going to be all last year's Cisco and best relievers in baseball will be next year. And the third guy, yeah, Adam I mean, that's that, that's, that's stuff it. that's sticky. And that's exactly what we want with this bullpen. Depth, 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 depth. It's not sexy. It's not cool. It's not fun. But depth is what makes these teams separate themselves from the rest. Look at the Astros. Look at the Dodgers. Look at the Braves. Of the teams that have won recently, they all have depth and they all have really good teams. So I'm glad that the Mets are built that way. Of course, there were a little bit of subtractions from the Mets. And I feel like this is a big one to talk about is that James McCann was traded to the Baltimore Orioles. It was, it was for a player to be named later, right? I think. Yeah. So yeah. we had a James McCann trade going to the Baltimore Orioles. Obviously, we signed Omar our Omar Nervaez this offseason. We have Tomas Nito and you have Francisco Alvarez. So now the catcher room, the catcher outlook or catcher outlook this season definitely looks a little bit more clear in our eyes, at least of what the plan could possibly be with Narvaez being a lefty, Nito being a righty, Francisco Alvarez being the young gun with, I, I don't want to say something to prove, but he's still, you know, he's still young. He's 21 or whatever he is. Like, that, I, I feel good about what just happened there. I think technically, since there was some shuffling of our episodes over the last few weeks that we didn't actually ever talk about Omar Narvaez okay. on this show, you saying that just clued me in. So we should talk about Omar Narvaez yeah. a little bit as a catcher who, when he came up, he was a guy who was an absolute bat first catcher and the defense was something that completely lagged behind. Somehow over the last three years, he's flipped and he's become a hitter who is average, can be above average. Last year he was below average, but the defense has really been rejuvenated since I believe he spent time with the Brewers in Milwaukee. He's become a very good framer, which is something that's still going to be very important for the next few years because there's no indication that there's going to be an electronic strike zone anytime soon. So you want a good framer back there. He moves well. I think he's only 30 years old still, I want to say, but maybe he's a little bit older. I'm searching him right Young now. Young 30s. On. I wow, I, just got, I got the most aggressive ad ever on Fangrass. That was the entire page. He, <laughs> he is 30 years old still. And something else that's incredibly important about Omar Nevaez that's very unique in the baseball catcher landscape is that he's a left-handed yep. hitter. It's almost impossible for a catcher to be a left-handed hitter because they're all right-handed throwers. And it's not very common that people reverse like that. Just back to my mic. Having him as a left-handed catcher, while you have a beautiful, wonderful defensive first catcher like Tomas Nito, who has proven he could put the ball in play and was cl very clutch last year, runs a square position. And then the opportunity to have a weapon like Francisco Alvarez on your roster, who likely will be at some point this year, another right-handed bat, who maybe there's something to be desired behind the play at this point in his young career, but he's a guy who's definitely going to be able to hit immediately right when he comes to the league. This is a whole nother chess piece, a whole nother way for Buck Showalter to be able to maneuver late in games if they wind up carrying all three of these players, two 2.5 catchers, if you will, 2.75 catchers. Having that lefty who can start against the righties, you bring in the lefty, Tomas Nino's much better against lefties, being able to make that switch, both guys are good on defense, or having Narvaez late game with a good right-handed reliever or a good right-handed starter, even maybe second or third time through the order, movement for Nito and not have to worry about that. That's a very useful, beneficial move for this organization and i love the good. idea of francisco alvarez being in a emergency catcher role let the guy mash let the guy hit if that's what the plan is going to be because like you said being able to switch those guys late in the game is big how many times last year were we like man it would be interesting if we could pinch hit for a catcher but it's dangerous because when you only have one left on the bench if that guy gets hurt who jeff big deals catching the rest of the game we know is the emergency catcher and as much as we love jeff and think he can do anything Catching's probably not something I really want Jeff McNeil to do for the New York Mets. So, yeah, I mean, Omar Nervaez was someone that I think a couple years ago, definitely people looked at a lot differently than they do now. But his improvement defensively and the fact that he has shown the ability to be a good hitter, that's there's not a lot of catchers that do one. So being able to have done both at points in his career, is it realistic to say he's going to be able to play at that level again? Maybe, maybe not. Well, we're yet to see. But the idea is that he can play at both of those levels is, is really interesting. And it was just this really sneaky, I want to say shrewd move by the Mets. Nobody saw that one coming. No, and it was also just another clear indication. And we we know this by now as Mets fans who pay attention to this team for the last two off seasons. 
it really became clear last May when the team moved on from Robinson Cano that if there's something that they don't like internally or they don't think is good enough or they think they can improve upon, money is not an issue whatsoever. And this front office has proven that time and time again. It's really comforting and really refreshing to see the team be able to just make improvements any way, shape, or form necessary and deal with deal with the financial costs in their no, own 100%. Way. I, I love that. I love that. You don't want to... It, it seems like money is not the first thing that gets thought of. It's how can this team be good? And that's extremely refreshing as a Mets fan. Any, honestly, any team, any f- team that you're a fan of, when money isn't an issue, I mean, we just saw Rafael Devers sign that $300 million contract with the Red Sox, that extension. When money's not an issue, you feel great as a baseball fan. Definitely. And so wish James McCann the best. Nice guy. We'll play amazing counts. in Baltimore. Just, haunt just, the Yankees, please. Please haunt yeah. the Yankees, James McCann. Just, Push, push Adley Rushman to first base so we can have a much more fruitful <laughs> career as a hitter. <laughs> Takes away the fancy value, though. And that's it. Yeah, well, I mean, unless he, unless he still catches 10, 15 games a year, 20 games a year, depending on your settings, it actually makes him significantly more valuable. But just like the Estevar show effect. Other news, people coming into the organization. This past week, team hired Eric Hinsky as a new assistant hitting coach after Eric Chavez was promoted to bench coach and Jeremy Barnes to head hitting coach. Hinsky, longtime player. He was around the block. He was like that classic guy who played for every team, played every position, who everyone like knew about, but he was never he was never really never an all star type. He was never very heralded. He was with Billy Upler in the Angels organization twenty seventeen. Seems like a good good baseball guy to come into a good hundred percent. Yeah. Eric Hinsky, I kinda maybe this is not correct, but I remember he was like a pinch hit king. He was so good at pinch hitting. And it felt like there was almost like a I don't want to say a passing of the torch because I don't think they crossed paths like that. But like Matt Stairs was kind of like the elite lefty pinch hitter for a really long time. That's what everybody knew Matt Stairs for. And then I feel like Eric Hinsky kind of took over that role once Matt Stairs left. Like, just big pinch hit moments. He's a good hitter. John was just telling us in the chat, and I saw it on Baseball Reference too, Eric Hinsky won the Rookie of the Year in 2002 with the Blue Jays. And let me tell you, that rookie year was phenomenal. 24 homers, 38 doubles, 84 RBIs, and he stole 13 bases. So, I mean, Eric Hinsky was a really good hitter, a really good player, 12 years in his career, just under 1,000 hits for a guy, again, who ended up being mostly a pinch hitter. It's just good. Like like getting smart, young, progressive-thinking people in the organization that can help boost this team up, and Eric Hinsky seems like he's going to be a part of that. And just more ball players. I mean, the team really took to Eric Chavez last year, and it's another, another good baseball man. 100%. Bring and you brought, talked about another guy coming in uh, offensively on the – the depth side, we have Danny Mendick, who I got a feeling will probably become a fan favorite. He's just a real scrappy player, can play a bunch of different positions, came over from the White Sox, paying him about a million dollars to be, like, at worst, the depth piece, you know? Um, and it's something that the Mets definitely need. We talk about it every every episode. Every episode, you guys probably hate it, but got 26 men on the roster. Every single player on this team should have a role, should have a job, should have an impact on the roster. And Danny Mendick is a guy who is even further back possibly and could have an impact on this team. So good little scrappy player for sure. Yeah, shout out John. He loves Mendick. This is one of his favorite signings of the entire offseason. I wouldn't really expect him to be the guy who was last year where he had a 125 WRC plus and 290 batting average. That was that was kind of insane. He was running a 350 batting average on balls in play, which for a guy like Mendick who hits on the ground a decent amount and not particularly hard, that's unsustainable. But he can play a lot of positions, and it's just it's such a it's such a blessing that we're able to sign a player like Danny Mendick for a million dollars. So like, be in Syracuse yeah. if we need him. There's like the break glass in case of emergency infielder, which is a beautiful, a beautiful, wonderful place to be. This is like there would have to be what. I don't no, know, actually, not you don't say, say a say. word. There would, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there, there would, there would have to be a lot of things that happen for for John's favorite player, Mendick, to to wind up playing a significant amount. But just in case it needs to be, he can at least be around the average line of a baseball player with good defense and good Yeah, no, great. I, I really like that. And then I guess kind of to wrap up the moves and departures and all that. It's more of departures. Donald Smith, as we know, not with the Mets anymore officially signed with a new team, that team being the Washington Nationals. So we're going we're gonna to see a little bit of Dom Smith in this upcoming year. Uh, obviously, Dom's career did not end well with the Mets in terms of performance-wise, but uh, you know, as a player, as, as a guy, as just a person, he was extremely nice. We met him the one time when we were just getting started with the Mets, and he was extremely friendly, extremely nice. And it was during a time where he was playing really poorly, so he had all the opportunity in the world to be like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk to these guys. Like, I'm in a bad mood. 
guy came with a smile on his face. Like, you know, it's kind of like lame and cliche. Like, what did you do for me on the field kind of thing? But, you know, these guys are humans at the end of the day. Deserve to be treated like humans. And Dom Smith was definitely one of the, the good guys that the Mets had. So wishing the best for him. Hope he stinks against the Mets. That's kind of the MO around here. You leave the Mets, you play us, play like crap. But the rest of the year, play well. Go ahead. Have a great season. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's on to uh, the Washington Nationals now, James. Yep. And Dom, I mean, Dom had a wonderful year in 2019. He had an unbelievable year in 2020 where he was in over that short and COVID season. He was one of the best power hitters in all of baseball. He ran like almost a 20% power rate. It's kind of unbelievable. And that was it. Sometimes it doesn't work out. It's a cool, it's a cool little story about just like prospect development that you can be such a high draft pick, crush the minors, you fall down there, everything looks over. Suddenly you rebound, you look great again, things get bad again, you have another shot. It's it's Dom Dom's a great player, great person. Gonna be interesting to see how this ends up for him. Also, that day that Mark and I did meet Dom, that was like one of the first days we were like around the team and organizing and doing stuff with them. And it was it was a big handshake day for us. It was one of the first days we were in the production office, probably shook like 10 different people's hands. We went down in the field, we did a couple short little player interviews, and we shook a bunch of people's hands. And then Dom was the last person oh, yeah. we did. And we asked him some, some, some dumb quick questions. We made a TikTok. It was fun stuff. Oh. And <laughs> we went in. We went in to shake Dom's hand. We were done, and he went in for the dab, and we were still set on handshake mode. And it was just the most awkward little like hand meeting that you ever could possibly have. I I thought about it for weeks afterwards. I felt I felt bad that Dom Smith thought we That's... weren't cool after after a nice ta- a nice conversation with him. But still, wish oh, him all man, the best. Oh man, I can, that was so out of my memory until you just brought it up. And as soon as you mentioned handshakes, oh, I, I was like, never forget. That. Oh my god, I'll never forget the awkward Cringe. awkward handshake. And you know. We never we never got to make good on that. It was just we our, our experience yeah. with Dom Smith ended with an awkward handshake. So, <laughs> I mean, that's it. That, 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 that's that's the way season. the cookie crumbles sometimes. Last thing, a little bit of sad news, but you know, not actually sad news, but sad. No, sad yeah, but sad. happy. It's sad, good, good and bad. Bittersweet. It's bittersweet, James. There it is. This is bittersweet. Found a way to get it in the episode. Starting off the new year right, dropping a bittersweet. <laughs> Wayne Rendazzo, you guys know, uh, part of the voice of the radio side for the New York Mets with Howie Rose. Wayne is leaving. He is going to L.A. He's joining the Angels TV broadcast to be a play-by-play guy. And uh-huh. okay, not LA. yeah, all right, fine. Yeah, I mean, you're de- you're like 100 percent right. It's not LA. Like it very much is. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they simply did that for marketing, just like the New York Red Bulls play in Harrison, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, the New York Giants and Jets play yeah, in East yeah, Rutherford. There's a, there's a lot of uh, shifting around for the the marketing side, but yeah, Wayne's going to the Angels to do play by play. He actually did. So for those of you who watch national baseball, not just Mets. If you remember the 700 home run game for Albert Pujols, where uh, he hit the home run for the Cardinals against the Dodgers. Wayne was doing that game on Apple TV. Did a really, really good job as play-by-play when he was doing Apple TV stuff this past year. So Wayne's a, fa- a friend of the podcast. He came on, did an interview. Wish the best for him. And uh, it'll be nice because, I mean, you got Mike Trout and Shohei Otani over on the Angels. So when the Met game ends, you can now turn on the Angels game and you can watch Wayne Randazzo do the play-by-play for two of the best players in the game. I'll miss Wayne just from how much I listen to the Mets games on the radio. He's been the radio voice in the Mets since 2019. Him and Howie had such a great rapport. They had so much fun together. Wayne was always very nice walking around production in the cafeteria. He's just a great guy. He's, he's loved baseball so much. And he's so incredibly talented. He's going to be announcing games for a team with two of the best two best players in the entire sport. So there's going to be a lot of attention. It's going to be a lot of appeal. He's taking over from Matt Vaskersian, who's also a superstar. There's, it's going to be very cool to see Wayne be able to you know, spread his wings Ooh, and fly. Nice. And also, yeah, it'll be, it'll be fun to see who's, who I'm going to be listening like to Angels, Howie this Isn't year. that from Angels in the Outfield? Don't they do this? <laughs> spread his wings yeah. and fly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Wayne, Wayne's really nice. I mean, again, wish the best for him. Maybe we'll uh, get to talk to him before he heads out to California, or maybe we'll talk to him on Zoom when he's in California. Who knows? And if you guys are interested, go back and check out that interview we did with Wayne Randazzo. It was about 25, 30 minutes. He talked all about getting started as a broadcaster, his favorite calls, partners, crazy jobs he's had, thoughts about the Mets, thoughts about how he was really, really cool. Really cool interview. Yeah, so wishing the best for Wayne. Uh, I know we've we've only had a short experience with him, but I know uh, producer John, Johnny Stats, has known Wayne for Johnny for a Tracks. pretty long time and can definitely give a little bit more just about Wayne and what he's done and just what a good guy he's been. Yeah, hundred percent. First of all, happy new year to the two of you. It's thank nice you, thank to, you, John. It's nice to see you guys after a, a little bit of a, a hiatus. And we'll talk about New Year's in a moment. But yeah, I mean Wayne is a he's a rising star in this industry. 
Um, you know, people, I don't think realize just how good he is. Uh, diehard baseball fan. You know, we were exposed to Wayne, spent a lot of time with him. He was featured in our pregame shows. Um, I got to work with him on a couple of national broadcasts. Um, the guy loves baseball. And, you know, you see him, he'll be walking around watching MLB TV on his phone. Um, so like you said, he eats, sleeps, breathes baseball. Um, he's done Fox. He's done Apple, as Mark alluded to, with uh, the 700th home run. He does college hoops. He does college football. Um, this is not the last stop for Wayne Randazzo whatsoever. Um, so that's one of the two vacancies in a, in a broadcast filled. I don't know if you guys knew the Cardinal job is also open right now. So I'll be uh, I'm curious to see where that job goes. Uh, I know that uh, Bob Costas and Joe Buck were asked to do a part time gig. I don't think that's going to be happening, but um, yeah, yeah, a, a little bit of musical chairs. I, I I heard there was a there was a slight chance that a, a certain man of faith could be in the running. So that makes sense. And when I heard about the opening, I immediately thought of him. Um, I mean, Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt hit plenty of deep drives to left. So yeah, they do. <laughs> they would, do. It would make sense. Um, I, I don't know. You know, I'm not here to speculate on what Bally Midwest is going to do with their, uh, with their opening. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure that's what our listenership really wants to hear about Listen, speculation on the Cardinals. This, it's, a, it's a big job. It's a big job. That's a big this job. podcast. This is a would big never job. speculate about anything. This we, is, we, this is speculation. No, we were, no, no speculation. This, this is not a speculation podcast. When I was in college, I was lucky enough to interview one of the best college basketball writers out there, a man by the name, John Rothstein. Yes. And John Rothstein told me. Imagine. You don't speculate on speculation. So mm. that's that's where I was like, this guy is different. John Rothstein is different. As you guys know, I'm a big fan of John Rothstein. But anyway, I just want to check in and see how your guys' Huge. New Year's were. Um, do you have any resolutions? Um, OH! James. I O! <laughs> new Year. James the new, the new Year jokes. absolutely never, never began. Um, I never... I never had a new year. There is no new year. There's no such so thing as a new year. Just, I know that some listeners no. out there don't love college Tough. football talk, but this was an epic college football day. It was unbelievable. It, it was, was it was one of the best slates of college football. The best, ever one of the best days of college, one of the best days of football that we've ever. It seen. was a great weekend. I mean, especially for you, you have Ohio State blow a two touchdown lead in the fourth quarter after Michigan loses. Oh. You could you could be the ones going to play TCU. You're literally a quarter away from probably a natty. Oh, that was it was a national. No matter what happened in, in TCU versus Michigan, this was the national championship game. Well, it that's was. what they thought in Michigan about the Horn Frogs. I would not be so sure. I would not. Be, you see, Mattress Mac threw down a. I think a buck five on the Horn Frogs. That guy's got such silly amounts of money; it's impressive. I guess you didn't see that. Well, I mean, that was that was. I mean, I guess we'll talk about college football now for the last five ten minutes of the show. I was so disgusted by Ohio State after the Michigan game, like going into the playoff. I just I thought there was no chance, but then suddenly, as the week went on, up until the week, I like the hype video came out. I got pretty excited. You know, the Buckeye blood started coursing through my veins again. I was like, CJ Stroud is five star recruit. Why can't he do this? And then suddenly. The 48 hours before the game, the spread went from seven to six and a half, mm -hmm. six and a half to six, six to five and a half, five and a half to five, and it closed at minus four and a half. And then you, all the gambling people on Twitter were saying that the 16 largest bets on the spread came out for the Buckeyes. All the public money was on Georgia, but every single person who knew what was going on and was sharp was betting on Ohio State. And I sat there on a, I had a long drive on Saturday morning, helping a friend move, and I called like my my friend from school, shout out Reed, the loyal, used to be a loyal listener of the show, but you know, he, he left when we went Hollywood <laughs> and he was like, he's, he's as cynical as me, if not more. And we were both like, I think, I really think we can do it. And then to get to the game, to blow two separate, two, two possession leads to let Stetson Bennett have a perfect fourth quarter when his, 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 his own head coach had him kneel the ball after a near interception when the first half was concluding to to run the ball on first mm. and 10 on the 30 mm. yard line with 25 yes. seconds left when you you have a college kicker this is not Justin Tucker this is not the NFL 40 yard field goals in college football are not yeah. gimmies this is not something that happens very often especially a team like Ohio State you oftentimes get to the end zone this was not something that you should ever be comfortable with and then as the clock gets near midnight I had transitioned from a pregame with friends to a party with friends in a place where I didn't know anybody I was in Providence Rhode Island helping a friend move just we were, we were just out and about. It was a Western party. Mark knows how much I hate country Ooh. music. So I was already not comfortable. I had to go on these people's smart TV after I was assured the game would be on 
download the watch ESPN app, log into my own credentials to it <laughs> and watch the game. Move. I, I moved with my hands. <laughs> the, the pong table. Sorry, Kavito, cut that one out. <laughs> out of, away from the rooms. So I had enough space in between myself and television to not see pixels. And then <laughs> it's 11.59 and it's third and eight or whatever it was on the f- f- freaking 34 yard line. And some girl oh, behind no. me, a woman, I guess I should oh, say, no. She said, the ball's dropping. We have to change oh, it. God. And she, I, I was like, I had my hand over my head because I couldn't even watch. I wasn't realizing what was going on. And I look back at the TV and I see Ryan Seacrest's stupid mug on the television. And I look back at this woman. I've never met her in my life. Friend of a friend of a friend. No, never. Well, I will never see her again. I couldn't even pick her out of a lineup right now because so many things were happening that night. It was, it was active beforehand. I look at her and I let off. A, a prof- I'm not proud of it. A little bit of a tirade. <laughs> what the f are you Rightfully doing? Rightfully so. You at blah blah. What? What in the world is wrong with wow. you? I said, what is wrong with you? And then I went on my phone in the rain outside and watched the last two plays on my wonderful iPhone 13 and watched it happen. The second, the second line of the field goal, I saw his face. There's no chance <laughs> it's going to happen. It's ridiculous that Marvin Harrison was knocked out of the game with targeting. They picked the flag waiting, up and played the way changed the entire game. Waiting, it was first yeah, and goal from the one. for that excuse. It was the first and goal from the one. Ohio State did get the benefit of some calls early. Then the Kirby Smart fake timeout and the fake punt. That was unbelievable. I know you could call timeouts after balls yeah. were snapped. That's the SEC juju right there. Um, it was unbelievable. And after it happened, I, I felt it, this was the biggest punch in my gut I think I've ever had as a sports fan, maybe besides the 2006 Mets. Because I in my, mm. in my head, we'd won, and we'd already been national champions. It, it, this made the Padres series in my brain feel like feel like a a, a, a summertime picnic. <laughs> I I was laying down in a random lawn in Providence, Rhode Island, letting the rain pour over me, just with my phone on my chest. I called a couple different Ohio State friends. I had to call my parents because I couldn't even think straight. I was just listening to Marvin's room out loud. I walked around the block. I I had words with a garage door. <laughs> What'd you was, say to the it door? Was a, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, yeah, I didn't like what he said. We had to square up. <laughs> it was, it was, it was as bad as it as so you had it sounds like gotten, as a, as a loss as a sports. Sounds player. like an episode of Kirby enthusiasm with the like the game's gonna be on. Yeah, the game's gonna be on. You get there, the game's not on. You have to do your thing. All of a sudden, that the moment that the only moment mm-hmm. you care about it changes channel, and you're like, "What are you crazy?" Like I see Larry David a hundred percent with that. It what Richard Lewis is an Ohio State guy though, right? Yeah, Ohio State graduate, class of like 66 or something insane like that. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely didn't ingratiate myself to all these random people at the party. The next few hours of it, you know, I had to do a lot of work to get back in the good graces after after they heard me screaming like my arm had just been chopped off on their own front lawn, the stranger they never knew before the night began. But yeah, it was it was as bad as it could possibly get. And this, this is a plea to the NCAA, the horrible, horrific organization, the rats they are. Why does this game keep happening on New Year's Eve? This is the third time in five playoff appearances, you know, humble brag, that Ohio State has this is played why they this game this. on this New Year's Eve. This is why Eve. humble brag. <laughs> oh, oh, and three on New Year's Eve, two and oh on New Year's Day. Can, 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 can they throw us a bone, please? Are you talking one time? about the, uh, the Utah game last year as well? Does that count on that? Are you talking? No, I'm talking okay, about playoff appearances. Okay, because that was the Rose Bowl. Okay. I mean, gotcha. yeah. I think that. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't care about the, the fun balls. We care about the I, real ones. I think. If you're gonna have the New Year's Eve games, it's gotta be earlier. You can't you can't clash mm. with the time that the ball is dropping. The game didn't start until like eight twenty five. It was a long and th- game. This game there were like what eight? There were like eighty passing well, attempts. Ohio State might have ran the ball twelve times, including once on their own thirty <laughs> with twenty five seconds left. For after they just passed for sixty yards in fifteen seconds, <laughs> it's for some reason. But that, I digress. How many breakups do you oh think? My God. Now I know what it feels like for a lot of these other teams because we have a head coach who doesn't know. He, oh, here he we is go. An, he is allergic here to winning go. football games. Here I, can't, I'm not, I guess I'll, I'll stop <laughs> now. But he, no, he, he's he is a loser. He's a good coach <laughs> mentally, but he's a loser. I'm, I'm excited. He is. I think it also didn't help too that uh, one of our good friends, Alex, who had made a a very keen wager. At the around the ten minute mark in the second quarter, when Georgia was down two touchdowns, I like that. Sprink, sprinkled a little, sprinkled a little sauce on the Georgia money line because I mean, plus two hundred for the best team in college football. Is that's a no brainer. And then he was just giving it to James at the end of the day. So me and him, I mean, you guys will be hearing this the next day, but we're we're all planning on grabbing some food, grabbing some drinks tonight. It's gonna be interesting to see the first meeting of these two after uh, after the debacle, especially because the one friend thinks James is really mad at him. Well, I mean, 
from from James's well, story, I, yeah. I was saying some. I was saying some. From your story, I I kind of feel bad. Like I was rooting for Ohio State early in the day, and then full disclosure, okay. no, I was. I mean, I was giving you the OH. I was asking you get the IO back through text, through voice. Like I was. Then I placed the parlay and I took a greasy Georgia money line as the third leg, and I was about to cash out actually when they were down two touchdowns. DraftKings was offering me like my full wager back, and I was like, you know what? Screw it. Go dogs. <laughs> and um, like, I kind of felt bad for you after the kick was uh, just oof. I mean, oof. Bad miss. But I, I, I close. I, was, it wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't even, wasn't good for, it would have been bad. It would have been no I, good for I, me. I, heard, <laughs> I do wonder. That luckily would have hurt more because the second they ran the ball, I was like, this is over. Well, Stroud pulled a Zach Wilson. If they would have actually gone he to He ran like the, straight back. He almost took a big sack. That almost kicked. I know. He almost did, but he got out of it. So for, he, he played one of the best games of college football i think any of us have actually ever seen like he was like Played perfect really well. for 99 percent of it and then he made that last play it was bad but to take the ball out of his hands with 25 seconds left on the 30 yard line you you have you have to be in a little animal it was animal do you guys have it was one of the worst coaching decisions ever. well he's not going anywhere so i hope you know that <laughs> But that's actually that's literally the worst part because he he played well enough to make people believe losing in losing he's not a loser. This was the worst case scenario because if he would have won, he's back. Like build the statue, we're national champions, we did it again. And if he would have gotten crushed, he's gone because you lost to Michigan twice in a row and you were embarrassed by a team in the SEC that you're building your team to beat. The fact that we did almost beat them, outplayed them entirely, should have could have easily beat them. I get, it means I guess we're still in the same tier. It's just he he's he is a loser. He doesn't have he doesn't have the killer bone. Couldn't beat the mailman. Stetson Bennett. He always delivers. Stetson What's Bennett's up? like my age, I think. I hate him. Stetson crazy. Bennett is. I hate him. He, no, he's. I hate him so much. No one talks about this. Stetson Bennett played high school football at the age of nineteen. No one talks about that enough. He was nineteen years old playing high school football. I mean, listen, messed up podcast, bucked up podcast, whatever it is, you know, that's <laughs> this that's is worth talking right about, now. though, because, you no, know, yeah, we've this all, is we've, a good story. Yeah, we've all been through those bad losses. I was going to actually ask you, James, where this loss ranks for you all time individually, because uh, this is an all timer. So number two. two behind behind it's 06, two. you said number two. It's number. I mean, the thing is, like the other the Ohio State loss in 2000 on uh, New Year's Eve in 2019 against Clemson mm-hmm. might have hurt more because there were so many obvious instances in that yeah. game that really would have done it like this game the defense like completely blew it they fell apart like i said the one thing that couldn't happen was defenders fall down again like the mission game and the big play happened when defender literally fell down when georgia had a first and 10 their own 20 down 11 and if that drive takes four minutes instead of 20 seconds it's an entirely different half yeah. there like the whole court is different that was ridiculous especially with lathan ransom put such a good like an okay relatively the rest secondary a good game but that Clemson game hurt more because I hated mm. them. I hate, I still hate that, but he's a complete <laughs> fraud. And the fact that we we lost that game very much because of two calls. One that was a fumble that was overturned as an interception after the receiver took three steps. And then Nick Bosa, one of our best players, getting called, taken out for targeting in the second quarter. Just ridiculous. But that those two are close. I think Mets 2006 is probably still worse just because. That was the year. It was yeah. uh, the way, the way, the way, yeah, that was the years, the way, the way we got down to that spot. Rangers 2014 was also really oh, awful. Thanks. That's it. By, that's probably finishes my Mount thanks Rushmore. Bringing that, up. that was just to go the overtime, what, three times in a series. That was, <laughs> it was kind of like the 2015 miserable. World Series. They but led it, the whole time and lost in five, <laughs> which is tough. Yeah. To do, which is tough I, to do. Yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. That was. 2015 World Series was bad too, but like we were down the whole time, so I was like, whatever. Like after Game Three, we knew kind of how that was going to go. After Game One, after after the first at bat of the series, we kind of had the feeling uh, in our hearts. The, it was the, actually yeah, bad. It was I, the quick pitch. I can't, I the can't Alex even... Gordon home run was the uh, that was yeah, the true yeah. kick. I, real quick for you guys, I don't know the second the second you kick a ball for an inside the park home run, <laughs> whatever. I, I walked into my office the, uh, on Tuesday and shout out Sporty Jordy. She was like, "Wow, this has been a bad sports yeah, season." T- Wait, so James. I was like, yeah. Did you have any feelings because you've spoke about it before when you you punched a hole in the table? Was it were you close? Oh yeah. I mean, if that garage door was weaker, I sure I certainly would have got <laughs> what through. Was it, it. Okay, so the- was it steel? <laughs> well, what, what, what metal are we talking? It was. It was. It was aluminum. It was, it was definitely hard. There oh, was the definitely fist. definitely something. Yeah. Was not not bad. bad. Not bad. Well, James, it's a new year, and not that's bad. good, and we have a lot to look forward to for uh, the Mets in 2023. Real quick, no, yeah. you guys have some New Year resolutions. Yeah, amazing, unique ways to bring. I do. Resolutions. I right, think look. you guys are gonna. This this is gonna be crazy for you guys to hear. Uh, we gotta bring Vito in on yeah, this too. Vito's gotta have a New Year New Year's resolution. But 
I uh, in the apartment that I live in, there is a gym, and as James knows through living with me and not being a a, a workout guy, I will be doing a workout this uh, for a little bit. We'll see. I got a little bit of a belly, a little bit. You know, I, I indulge a little bit in the food and and such. So we're trying to shave off the belly a little bit. I don't need to lose weight by any means. I don't think I need that. But you look great. I shouldn't be 26, 27 years old and having a belly. So trying to lose a little weight. We're going to walk on the treadmill, a little bit of incline as Vito sent the the workout to me. I believe it's the TikTok hot girl walk, I believe is what it's called. And listen, it sounds hot about girl right. Summer's, hot girl summer's coming up. So, you know, I'm doing I'm the 5, 15, 30. It's, it's 15 incline, five speed, 30 minutes. Yes, but you can't, minutes, you can't be yes. holding on. That's the thing. Holding on no is holding. cheating. Oh, okay. That's yeah, good to know. I probably would have held on. I've never been on a treadmill before. That's not true. What do you mean? You've never been on a treadmill before in your life. Well, I, you don't understand. I'm, how, could, I'm, how could you say that's not I'm possible? I've been sedentary for seven years. I'm allergic. I'm allergic to running. I played baseball. I mean, I loved baseball. It was I, John. F- John, from 2017 to 2019, Mark Mark walked probably like six. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. In, while I was in college, there was walking that was done. I, I oh, walked God. in college. You can say oh, from 2020 laughing. to 2023, that's a little more. I, I don't no, know. Once you. Once you once once you once you hit a big in college, I feel like you just you just put the feet. I up. mean, I was a big call an Uber to go home. I'm I could I, I could I mean. walk yeah, to yeah, class yeah. where I can move my car and park there. Yeah, You've I actually never been on a treadmill. No, I've never been on a treadmill. Like I, I've That's stood on a mall. treadmill. My my parent my grandparents had a treadmill in like their house or whatever. But it's not like I used it. I was five years old. Mm-hmm. I used to take my little matchbox cars and drive them down the the treadmill because it was on an incline. <laughs> yeah, it was great. But yeah, this will be my first time using a, a treadmill. So you tell me not to not to use my hands. It's big. That's big. Yeah, no walking. And I so you haven't started this routine yet. You're, you're... haven't. It's it's gonna start. You're gonna listen to this episode, guys. Just know I'm I'm walking while that's happening. Are you going to be listening to Met stuff while you do it? You know what? Probably not because okay. I just I went through 45 oh, minutes of hearing myself. And, All right. You know, I, I think I have a great voice, but I don't need to hear myself speak any more than I do during the day. Fair enough. All right. Well, I like that you're not doing it on like January 1st, January 2nd. There's yeah. nothing worse than being in a gym on one of those days, and it's just an absolute zoo. So good for you. All right. What about you, John? What do you got? Oh, me. Um, okay. I have, a, I have two. Um, two, okay. I have two. So one is, I want to start reading more. Oh. Um, I had. I'm a. I'm a phase reader. I go through phases. I'll. Did you Google New Year's resolutions. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you guys Google good New Year's no, resolutions? No, this, go to the gym no, and read is, more. This is a good. This is a real one. So, uh, I've been reading one book. I actually started. It's uh, an educational book uh, teaching me about what I shared with you guys and I will eventually mm-hmm. share with um the listeners, whoever cares. Tax evasion. Um but I yes. <laughs> but I um let's just say I'm very ignorant <laughs> on this uh counting cards. Counting cards. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what I'm trying to perfect. Um no, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing in this uh arena of life, sphere of life. So um yeah, it's and it's it's nice. It helps me go to sleep at night. Um, Vito actually also lent me a great book that I'm looking forward to starting, uh, called the baseball 100, but I can't, what's, his, what's Joe, the author's name? Joe, Joe Poznanski. Poznanski. Oh. I'm really looking forward to starting it, but I, I don't think you can read two books at once. Um, some people think you can, I kind of just don't, I gotta, you know, be dialed in on the one I'm reading. So I have a lot to learn, like I said, about this one thing. So I'm going to finish that one first, but I'm looking forward to starting the second one. And the other thing is cooking more oh um you said you said two. help out a little bit around this seems house. like three no no that's it it's reading and cooking he just has breathing and cooking just oh okay yeah, I that's what... yeah, I, yeah i have two books but my <laughs> each book is its own re- re- resolution <laughs> no, no one's about baseball but yeah cooking i used to i don't know when i moved out of my parents house i was really into cooking when i was in college i was into cooking i'll make chicken parm i would do all these exqu- make all these exquisite meals um and then kind of like mark i got real lazy with it um you know part of that is you guys know what part of that is um but i want to <laughs> get back i want to get back in the game um it's fun to do it's nice to help out pitch in um and have the fruits of your labor be uh physical um you know it's satisfying yeah. it's satisfying to make food that you eat yeah you know it's healthy you know where it's coming from it's cheaper 
it's all good. So are you guys are you guys chefs? Do you guys cook? Or am I the only am I the only animal here? Oh yeah. I'm a I'm a big I cook, cook as well. I cook I need all. to cook a little more consistently. Love to cook. I'm a very consistent cooker. James cared to share your maybe we'll, maybe we'll do maybe a cooking class. Hey, maybe we'll do a little oh my news are I was gonna say, oh, we'll do we'll do a little, little messed up podcast. Rest yeah, I like that. We'll do, we'll do I think we should do a cooking show. show. I think that's what you're Chop. getting. I'm in. At. I'm in. Oh, yeah, that'd yeah. be awesome. Uh, the four of us and Mister Met in the in the kitchen <laughs> city. It's actually a good idea. That would actually kill. We yes. should do that. But my, are you asking for things I cook? Or resolution. Oh, resolution. Okay, not both. Resolution, just simply based on the way the year started, it's just let let the blackness of my heart take over. Oh, that's, the, that's the whole resolution. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah no, there. we had we had an active month, right? We had we had an active month right before uh, New Year's. I made, made some business developments. So you know what, New Year, New Year, just just sharpen the teeth. That, that's that's the resolution. Well, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say mine. That's it. No, no and more. No this more. This is no exciting. More this is the first time that a question was asked, and everybody went around and said their answer. We made it around the circle. Yes. We did it. <laughs> That's actually my other New Year's resolution. Answer questions that John asked on the podcast. Um, yeah, my New Year's resolution is uh, just I'm just going to make it get married at the end of the year. Um, I don't think I have to do I think I'm going to just do that. It's not Good. really a resolution. I think I'm pretty perfect on my own right now. Huge. You know? I learned how to drive it's last year. That would have been my resolution. You know, it's a big resolution. Shout out, Mr. Shout Carlos. Mr. Carlos. Hawaii driving school. <laughs> Can't thank him enough. Uh, you know, like I don't know what to say outside of that. I learned how to drive, change my job and everything. I feel like at this point, just get married at the end of the year. I'm fine with that. That's a big. That's a big milestone. I Cash. feel like so. I I think everyone will accept that as a, as you. a good choice. I would even tell you that it's so it's happening so close to the end of the year. You can roll that one <laughs> over. Good husband. Be like I don't need that. I got married last year. <laughs> and then the year after that, you've been married for a year. You'll be you'll be in the sweet spot like John, where now you have yeah. to start improving yourself again. Ooh. And then you could do it. Yeah. Two years. And it's harder than it looks. Trust me, Vito. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, I think that's a every now that was funny. By the way, Vito's New Year's resolutions. People are gonna not know whether he's eighteen or 30. yeah. That's true. That's true. I think let's if you take a look at me, you can figure out which one I'm closer to. No, let's keep it. A, let's keep it a mystery. I don't know. It's hard to tell. We should. Yeah. The veil. Everyone on the podcast knows John's thirty-seven now, so it's gonna be fun to keep. I, I was thirty-four last time. Oh, I forgot. This is yeah. I, I got gotcha. you <laughs> incrementally. Yeah. John just remembered the bit. It's it's been like a month since we've put out an episode yeah. of us just hanging out and talking. So, understandably, hopefully not too rusty for you guys. Hopefully, uh, gave you some stuff to talk about again. We know we can't talk about it, but we know It'll come. it will come whenever whenever something happens. You know, we're gonna talk about it. So. Make sure you guys are following us on all our social media at Mets Up on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok so that you know when something happens because then the episode's coming. So we'll be uh, super excited, hopefully, to talk to you guys again soon. There shouldn't be any big breaks coming anytime soon for us. Back on the weekly schedule, a couple interviews coming up, a couple you know, bonus content. We got some stuff with Omar Minaya as well in the pipeline. So we're super excited to show you guys that stuff. If you're looking for the YouTube version of this, again, go to the New York Mets YouTube channel. You'll be able to find us there. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, download, subscribe, drop us a rating, drop us a review. Cooper is Cooper. acting up. He's, he, he's ready. He's ready for the I didn't the even podcast. know he was in here. I'm not kidding. He's sneaky. He's How sneaky. did he get in here? <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a chaos. Close it up. This is Close a chaos way to end it. James, where do they follow you on Twitter? James underscore Shiano. At Giraffe Neck Mark. Thank you guys for listening and watching. We'll catch you on the next episode. Peace.